I am here with Dr. Gualtiero Piccinini, who is a philosophy professor at UMSL. Thanks so much, Dr. Piccinini, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So you've got a new book, and it's been published, and it's called Neurocognitive Mechanisms Explaining Biological Cognition. But biological cognition being the phrase, you're going to explain it. But what's cognition versus biological cognition? Like, could we just start with this? Sure. Uh, so cognition is just a term that many people use, including many scientists, for the kind of processes that explain intelligent behavior or adaptive behavior by complex organisms like human beings, but also typically lots of animals. And biological just refers to the fact that these are living creatures as opposed to robots or computers. So in your book, you talk about a computational theory of cognition. Is it that every time we see that word cognition, we should think biological cognition? Not necessarily, but in, in my book is focused on cognition by biological organisms like we are, as opposed to, you know, robots, neural networks, computers, artifacts. Mm. And, and the, com but, but, but the computational theory is relevant because um, it's an idea that goes back to the 1940s and it's that cognition works uh, by means of computation. You know, there's computations involved in figuring out how to respond adapt adaptively and intelligently to the environment, even by biological organisms. So it is, there's an analogy there between brains or nervous systems and computers. Now you talk about a neurocognitive mechanism. Could you tell me more about that? Maybe give me an example. Sure. Um, well, you know, it's been known for a while that the, the main organ of cognition is the brain or the nervous system. Um, and the nervous system is made out of mostly cells. Um, most of the cells that are involved in cognition are called neurons. And these neurons are connected together in networks. They form networks. So they send signals to each other. And then through sending these signals, they process the signals and they you know, try to extract useful information from these signals. And, you know, a network or a group of networks that does this, this kind of information processing or computation is a mechanism. A mechanism is just a bunch of items or, or you know, objects connected together in some way, you know, hooked up together uh, and they collectively cooperate to do something. Mm. So, so our, you know, neural cognitive mechanisms are the mechanisms for cognition. And typically, you know, in organisms, those are going to be neural mechanisms. I want to ask you about our cognitive capacity, but can you first explain what you mean by capacity so that we can understand cognitive capacity? Yeah. So capacity is, you know, is this a basic term? It's a, it's a something we can do and something we can do correctly or incorrectly. Uh, so for example, you know, the capacity to speak a language like English, we can do it correctly or we can do it somewhat incorrectly or we can even speak gibberish. Uh, so the capacity is uh, this ability that we have to use the language correctly. Um, and if we don't have it, then we wouldn't be able to speak correctly. Um, and so, you know, there's all these cognitive capacities that scientists try to explain things like perception, you know, the ability to perceive the world and understand it correctly or categorize it. Um, there is memory, which is, you know, carrying forward information in time. Um, there's motor control and decision-making and motor control, you know, figuring out what to do and how to do it at any given time. And, you know, you can elaborate on other cognitive capacities. These are the things that, you know, cognitive neuroscientists try, try to explain. Um, and, you know, my book is about how to explain these capacities. So how do you think that we should explain the capacities? Well, in terms of these um, mechanisms and what's interesting about these mechanisms is that they are multi-level, meaning that it's a very complex organization that involves very, very large systems of tens of billions of neurons uh, that they are made out of 
uh, smaller components, but they're still very large and complex systems like the cortex or portions of the cortex. And there's a lot of subcortical um, uh, systems. And then these are made out of what are called columns or not nuclei. And those are made out of um, neural networks, which are made out of neurons connected together by various uh, structures. And the neurons themselves you know, are co very complicated um, uh, system. So um, it has to be multi-level. You have to understand how, you know, the parts contribute together to do what, you know, a larger whole does, which then is part of a larger whole, which is part of an even larger whole. Um, and in addition to this, they perform um, these, these computational or information processing uh, functions. Uh, and to do that, they have to represent um, the way things are, roughly speaking, they have in these internal uh, models of the, of the organism and the environment and how the organism relates to the environment. So not every system does this kind of thing. There are many complex systems, even in organisms themselves. You know, we have a loco locomotive system, we have a circulatory system, we have a respiratory system, but, you know, we're focused on the neurocognitive system and what is peculiar to it. When you're talking about these systems and these levels, you use this word egalitarian ontology of levels. I mean, you use this word egalitarian a lot, but can you tell us first about the ontology of levels when it comes to these lower and higher level mechanisms? Sure. Uh, as I said, these are complex systems, meaning they, they contain a lot of parts and there's an organization to the parts. And then, you know, there's like small parts like molecules. And then there's like larger parts like neurons and slightly larger parts like networks. And then, you know, columns and nuclei and subsystems and larger systems of neurons. And so um, these could be called levels, you know, levels of composition, you know, the parts compose the whole, but there's lots of part whole relations, you know, that you can study. And um, historically, a lot of people, including a lot of philosophers, even many contemporary philosophers, have this idea that in this kind of situation where there are parts and holes, um, either the parts are more fundamental and the holes are more derivative or less fundamental, or the other way around, the whole must be the thing that's more fundamental and the parts are just sort of derivative or uh, uh, posterior, sometimes people say prior or posterior, um, or they talk about ground and they say, oh, the, you know, the parts are grounded in the whole or the whole is grounded in the parts, but it can't be both. So there is a hierarchy and they use this word hierarchy, which is, you know, a political word. Um, there's an ontological hierarchy, you know, from like the less fundamental to the more fundamental. And in the book, I argue against this. And I, and I argue that all these levels are, you know, ontologically on a par. It means they're equally real, they're equally important. They, they, they're, they're not like one grounded in the other, but rather they're all just basically um, different ways of looking at the same portion of reality or, or maybe different aspects of the same portion of reality. So, you know, they are there. There's real organization there in the world, in the system, um, but it's not like there is, there's one level that is in some way more important or fundamental than the others in any, in any significant sense. So you know, what we need to do as scientists or as philosophers is really think about how the parts make up the whole, how the, the smaller whole makes up the larger whole, and the properties that the parts have and each level of organization has um, we know which aspects those are and which aspects explain various phenomena. Um, this is a figure that I took out of one of your chapters. It's on page 39 of your book. Does this have anything to do with the explanation you just gave about the ontology of levels? It does, because one of the topics that's been debated a lot in this area is multiple realizability. The idea that um, one and the same kind of higher level function could be realized um, by 
many different lower level properties and 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 this this phenomenon of multiple realizability so you know there's many ways that to catch a mouse okay you can use electricity you can use a spring you can use glue um, so the idea is you can build a um, mouse trap with different kinds of materials that's put together in different ways that's the idea of multiple realizability well a lot of people have argued that because certain functions or certain higher level properties are multiply realizable, then you cannot reduce these higher level properties like being a mousetrap to something more basic, more fundamental, more lower level. And I say, sure, yeah, maybe, but first of all, more fundamental is beside the point because all these levels are really ontologically on a par. And then second, what, uh, many people have argued that follows from this multiple realizability doesn't actually follow. So these people who uh, stress multiple realizability often reach the conclusion that these higher levels are really distinct from their realizers. You know, being a mousetrap is just sort of this additional thing that any realizer doesn't quite have on its own. And I want to argue, no, 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 no. That's a whole other um mistake to think that that levels are distinct from one another so neither higher levels reduce to the lower levels nor are they distinct they're just aspects you know they're aspects of the same portion of reality uh, lower See, levels higher levels they're all different aspects it sounds like you're giving a defense of the computational theory of cognition that uses what we now know from neuroscience and, and cognitive science and psychology. And you're just defending this older view, bringing in all the new stuff. And that view is called the egalitarian integrationalist framework, which gives us a better alternative, if you're right, to these two theories, one being the reductionist and the other being the anti-reductionist. Could you kind of merge your previous answer with the rejection of these? Sure. Um, and so there's two things here. There's a kind of, there's this integrationist framework that tries to find this middle ground between traditional reductionism and traditional anti-reductionism. And that can apply beyond cognition itself. It's just a general view about the relation between different levels and how to explain phenomena that involve complex multi-level systems. It doesn't have to be cognition. It could be anything in say physiology or other, um, you know, other sciences that, that have to do with complex uh, systems. Um, mm -hmm. But then the specific uh, type of explanation that uh, becomes relevant when it comes to cognition is computational. So then there are going to be, there are going to be computations involved in neurocognitive systems. That's what's kind of special about them, or one of the things that is special about them, you know, computations and representations. Computations and representations, both of them together, they go together in this case, at least. And, um, and, and so this, the same point applies, you know, we need to integrate our knowledge about different levels to get the full picture and there's no like basic or more fundamental level compared to the others we really have to understand all of them to really understand how the system works so when you're explaining how a human being cognizes truth or like knows something how the consciousness stuff merges with the brain stuff so that i could know stuff you're saying I shouldn't have the view that the whole does reduce to the parts or that that the parts reduce to the whole, but something else. And then you're giving us a theory of what it is instead. Is that right? Yeah, that they're both part of the story, that both the whole and the parts. And so when you talk about the parts, you have to include more details because you have all these parts. Um, and so you can explain certain phenomena at a certain level of grain. Uh, but you're going to miss, if you try to explain everything in those terms, you're going to miss out on some uh, more global aspects of the system that you can really capture better when you think about what the whole does, um, you know, to what all these parts do when they're all together, organized in a certain way, you know, for a certain 
function to perform a certain function. So um, you, there's these, uh, you know, there's abstraction going on when you go from parts to whole, you're sort of emitting a lot of detail that doesn't help you explain the phenomenon of, of interest. You have to figure out what are the impo most important and most relevant variables. And when you're explaining multiple realizability, you say that one kind is medium independence, and then you, you explain what that is. Could you tell us what is this and how does it fit in to your defense? Sure, thanks. Um, so medium independence is a, is a phenomenon that's even more kind of specialized and more, and, and more um, rarefied than, than multiple realizability. You know, I gave the example of mousetrap. A mousetrap is, is it is a kind of thing that's multiply realizable because you can build it in different ways uh, but it still has only one type of input which is free mice in the environment and one type of output which is you know mice that are caught by the trap um, whereas when we have a medium independent um, kind of thing or kind of property um, the inputs and outputs are also themselves multiply realizable because the, the, this kind of property that's medium independent is defined just in terms of certain, what physicists call degrees of freedom. You know, it's like certain abstract variables or um, um, basically it's like abstract kinds of things. And, you know, these kinds of things can be, you know, there's, there's, there can be different types of signals or different types of variables that are involved. They can have different properties, but um, what matters is that um, the input is gonna be, let's say, some kind of sequence of states, like ones and zeros in a computer, but it could be, it could be a continuous variable uh, where you know, the, the values don't have to be limited to one and zero, they can be anything in between. Um, but, but what matters is that you take inputs that you can characterize in this kind of abstract way as sequences of ones and zeros or whatever it is, and you get these other sequences as output. So to give like a very simple example, you know, if you, if you get a zero as an input, you give a one as an output. But if you give, get a not one as an input, you give a zero as an output. If that's how you define your system, it doesn't matter if it if it's catching mice or if it's eating cheese or if it's you know manipulating voltages. What matters is that you have this way of distinguishing two types of input and two types of output, and 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 it reliably generates the right outputs from the right input. So that's medium independent. So it's a stronger kind of property than multiple realizability. It entails multiple realizability because you can do it in different ways, but it's stronger because even the inputs and the outputs are multiply realizable. And what we're talking about here is the brain, right? I mean, we're talking about like how you remember or how we get the input, which is like all the stuff in your visual perception and then how we like think, oh, I'm looking at a flashcard or something, right? I mean, it's the brain we're talking about. Yeah. Right. Well, you're making it sound like the brain is just a scientific thing a, a, a computer that could be made when you get the right parts connected to make the whole and when the whole is made up of the right parts so in what sense is your book just explaining how we are not anything in addition to like a computer um yeah thank you so Computation is medium independent in my, in my view, um, which I do also get into in the book. And um, I think there are good reasons to think that brains do perform computations. They have these medium independent inputs and outputs and vehicles that are cognitively relevant or functionally relevant. So, um, so there's computation going on and it's important to understand the computations in the brain. and uh, I also argue in the book that um, these computations are a special kind of computation. They're not like the computations in a digital computer. So they don't actually use ones and zeros, what we call ones and zeros. 
Um, they have a yeah, can you type. explain that? How is it not the analog or the digital? It's like the special thing. Yeah, so neurons send each other signals. Um, and the main vehicle for sending these signals are called action potentials. They're discharges of electricity that travel along these fibers called axons, and they get picked up by these other fibers from the downstream neurons called dendrites. So, you know, there's an neuron here, sends a signal through the, its axon, and it reaches another neuron over here that receives it through these other fibers called dendrites. Um, but then once it receives, you know, inputs from many other neurons through its dendrites, it performs operations, you know, it integrates these inputs, you know, in complicated ways. And we don't fully understand how this really works in brains, but we have some ideas, you know, and these ideas have become quite sophisticated about at least what happens, what are some of the things that happen most of the time. Um, and if you look at the properties of these signals, the, the action potential that travel through um, um, axons from one neuron to the other, and they affect each other, you know, they, they affect other neurons. Um, they have features that, um, some, you know, some features are somewhat similar to digital signals like ones and zeros, specifically the fact that they, they, they are either sending a signal or not sending a signal and it's not, graded the signal itself individual action potential is not graded like an analog signal it, it cannot take any kind of intermediate position or intermediate value it's you know either there's a signal or there's no signal but the frequency of the signal matters a lot and that's very different from digital signals in computers where the there's no there's no relevance of the frequency the frequency of ones and zeros in a computer doesn't matter at all. All that matters is the exact sequence that you're sending at any given time. You know how you know which, which which one is the value of each position. You know is is the first position a one or a zero? Is the second position a one or a zero? Is the third position a one or a zero? Those things matter absolutely in a computer, whereas in a brain they don't. And what does matter is how many of these signals are being sent. Um, and then in, in a particular interval of time, so the frequency. So that's different. It's different from digital and it's different from analog. And um, it is a point that has not been fully appreciated, especially by philosophers and many psychologists. So I do think it's, it's uh, useful to point it out. Yes, thank you for explaining that. So I went through the whole book, very briefly skimmed it, and it seems like you're not only explaining every little detail, but then you're putting those details together and you're giving this very nice explanation for how we know things, basically. I didn't come up with any objections or any part where I thought, oh, that doesn't make any sense. What do you think would be the strongest or more interesting objection to this huge theory that you're now putting into the literature? Um, well, interesting question to ask uh, an author. Um, I would say that one, one area where there's more thinking to do and um, it, might be, it might be possible to go beyond my, my, my argument or my view is in the degree to which neural processes are in fact medium independent. Um, so I do argue that there are certainly aspects of uh, neurocognitive processes that are medium independent. You know, for example, what I was stressing before, the frequency of these signals, that's a medium independent aspect of the signals themselves or the timing of the signal. You know, the timing of the signal is also a medium independent. I mean, you, you could realize those things, those properties of frequency or timing of something in lots of different media. They don't have to be action potentials. So you could reproduce that kind of thing in a, in a machine. But, um, but brains have actually different types of chemical signals that they send to each other. And they also, these signals, they're called neurotransmitters. Um, they, so they do have one important function, which is to, to, to go from the, the action potential that going through one uh, neuron, its accent, um, 
to stimulate the dendrite of the other neuron. So in between the two neurons, you know, there's like a tiny gap. It's called a synapse. And in between the, in, in that gap, there's chemicals that go from one neuron to the other, basically to tell the other neuron, oh, there's this actual potential that just reached you. So how do they know? How does the other neuron know? Well, because of the, the, the neurotransmitters, but there's different types of neurotransmitters. And the, 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 the different types of neurotransmitters can have different impact even on the same neuron. So they can also mod, like they don't just like simply transfer this information that a signal was sent. They can amplify it or they can dampen it or they can modulate the sensitivity of one neuron to the activity of another neuron. So, you know, there might be a case to be made that there are aspects of neural processes that are not, in fact, fully medium independent. Um, they're at least somewhat medium dependent. Um, and, and that might have something to do with consciousness. So I think that's, that would be a very fascinating question. I don't really get into this at all in the, in the book, but somebody else could think about that. Dr. Piccinini, my last question will be, is there anything you wish you did add that you didn't put in the book? <laughs> so this book took me um, a good 20 years to, to, to put together. And um, yeah, there is plenty that I didn't put in the book because this is a very long story, but there's also plenty in the book. It's already a long book. I do have some new work that extends the work in the book. So um, I'm not done either. Uh, and I hope other people are not done. So yeah, there's plenty more to do. Excellent, Dr. Piccinini. Thank you so much.